What is the most ingenious bomb to come out of World War II? You probably thought about something like the bouncing bomb or tall boy. Perhaps you even thought about the atomic bombs, either the little boy or the fat man. But did you think about this? So let's make something quite clear. No, the Allies did not attack the Germans with bottles of whiskey, empty or otherwise. But I would argue that one of the most ingenious bombs, or in this case a mine, to come out of World War II was actually called the Johnny Walker. The only problem was, much like if you actually downed a bottle of its liquid namesake, it was pretty useless when used in action. But was that the fault of the mine itself, or the way that it was operated? Not a lot has been published about this particular mine. Nevertheless, you will have heard of its first operational use, possibly without even knowing it. Its first and possibly last target was none other than the Tirpitz. When I first stumbled across the existence of this weapon and read how it worked, I couldn't help but think, damn, that's ingenious. So how did the thing actually work? Well, even the men who dropped them seemed a bit vague about this. In a post-war interview, Thomas Rathby Andrew, an NCO serving as a flight engineer with number 9 squadron, brought up the existence of the Johnny Walker, or JW Mine. He explained what he recalled about it while speaking about Operation Paravan. Most of the aircraft did carry the 12,000 pound bomb, but I understand there was a... We took with us a, an army warrant officer, I think, was, uh, designed this new type of bomb. And um, at least if you hadn't designed it, he was there to advise on it. And uh, I never knew his name, but apparently it, you drop the bomb in the ordinary way, uh, upstream of, of a target, um, of a marine target, obviously. And when it got down to a certain height off the ground, uh, a parachute opened. And the bomb then floated down into the water and hit the water. The parachute detached and the bomb sank. After a while, and it could happen several, quite a few times, I, I, I never knew how many, but quite a, quite a number of times this sequence could happen. Um, when the bomb had been in the water for a while, gases formed and it became buoyant and came up fairly quick. And it had a four pound, 400 pound warhead. And if that had hit the underneath soft plates of the turpits, it would have done a lot of damage. And it, of course, if it came up and then sank again without hitting it, uh, it would each time it would drift with the tide and hopefully, uh, on one of the times it came up, it would come up under something. It was a bit hit and miss, but if you dropped a lot of them, you had a chance of success, you see. In a nutshell, the JW mine was exactly that, a mine. One which was designed to be used against maritime targets. Like other sea mines, it could do the most damage by targeting the vulnerable underwater section of a ship's hull. For this, it was equipped with an explosive charge in its nose. Just how large the charge was varies based on the sources that you read. As we heard, Andrew thought perhaps it was a 400 pound warhead. According to Alan Cooper, it had a 90 pound Torpex detonation charge. Robin Bird, a researcher and author, describes it as a mixed bag of Torpex, RDX and TNT in a 400 to 500 pound warhead. Squadron leader Iverson, who also flew on the raid and actually dropped it, reported the total weight of the mine as 1,000 pounds. He wasn't a fan of the mine, and more on that later. Contradicting Iverson, Alan Cooper again put its total weight down as £4,000. As I said, not a lot has been recorded about this weapon, and getting a definitive answer is tough. Just for context, the Tallboy bomb that would be used alongside the JW mine had about £5,000 of Torpex in its warhead. The Johnny Walker was designed along the same lines as an oscillating mine. When dropped, the classic prickly looking sea mine will sink to a pre-programmed depth and remain there waiting for an enemy ship. The JW mine went one step further. Once it reached a predetermined depth, it would resurface in search of the enemy's hull. Then, if none was connected with, it submerged again to repeat the same procedure, all the time creeping forward with the tide. Again, I just think the concept was pure genius, and I think you will agree when you find out how this was done. Firstly, the mine was dropped from a fairly high level bombing altitude, sometimes as high as 12,000 feet. Once it was jettisoned, as Thomas Andrew had explained, a static line would engage a small parachute. This was probably attached to the bottom of the mine, which would actually be the top while in descent. The static line would also apparently arm the mine. The parachute was to ensure that the mine landed in the water as softly as possible. If it didn't, it might just detonate on contact with the water. Perhaps to protect against this further, a protective iron cap covered the front of the device, which was then jettisoned after contact with the water. Once the mine descended into the sea to about 10 or 20 feet, the parachute automatically detached. At the same time the mine's buoyancy was being controlled, 
A valve system could control the buoyancy chamber within the mine itself. From what I could gather from the limited notes on the device, this involved the hydrogen reservoir located in the nose being used to empty the buoyancy chamber in the tail. This is what halted the mine's descent at around a depth of 50 or 60 feet. At this point, the JW mine was acting in precisely the same way as any other sea mine. What came next is both a mystery and where the magic begins. Some feature of the design allowed the mine to automatically change its buoyancy and send it floating up to the surface again. How is not very clear. However, I'd suggest it involved seawater being pushed out of the buoyancy chamber by the hydrogen gas inside the mine. Rather than simply rising and falling vertically, the mine would walk sideways as it surfaced. Again, the how behind this isn't clear, but I'd guess that if seawater was indeed being pushed out of the device, this would have generated a small jet stream, enough to push the mine to one side or the other, perhaps. This basically made it a self-propelled smart bomb that sought out its own targets, if somewhat randomly. This unpredictable gate, according to sources, is where the name for the contraption comes from. Rather than being christened after one of the many military personalities with the same name, the culprit, does seem to be whiskey. According to a post-war letter discovered by Robin Bird and written by the Marine Aircraft Experimental Establishment's Chief Armament Officer, Dennis Tanner, like all good ideas, this one started down the pub. Apparently the concept for the mine was developed by British boffins from a secret development department aptly named MAD. The tale goes that they came up with the concept over drinks and of course they were drinking Johnny Walker. It's a good story, but perhaps that's all it is. Another really fascinating thing about these mines was that they were set to self-destruct after a certain amount of time. This stopped any being recovered by the enemy. Again, I just can't get over how much was packed into this relatively small piece of ordnance. Nevertheless, it was a specialist weapon and could not be used freely in shallow harbours or canals, the most likely place it would find its maritime targets. That would all change in September 1944. The Tirpitz was a major concern for the Allies for most of the war, especially for the British. Ironically, the threat never really materialised, but that didn't stop the German battleship from tying up much needed Royal Navy ships. The Allies spent the best part of four years trying to sink her, and this included efforts from both the Royal Navy, Fleet Air Arm, RAF and VVS, in no fewer than 26 attempts. So in September 1944, after years of indecisive actions, it must have been thought, Let's try out this new experimental mine. What have we got to lose? After more than two years since their last try, the RAF would launch another attempt against the mighty battleship. But it wouldn't be easy. Then moored at Karfjord, at the extreme north of Norway, there was no way to attack her directly from Britain herself. Thus, aircraft from two squadrons, the famous 617 and often forgotten 9 squadron, flew to Mother Russia to launch the attack. This in itself is a very interesting story, one that I hope to look into in its own video at some point. Let's just say here that the RAF had to take all that they would need with them to the remote Russian airfield called Yagodnik. This included the Tallboys and the JW mines. It was not all plain sailing. For many of the Lancasters, it had been difficult getting into Yagodnik due to unexpected low cloud. And so on the morning of the 15th of September 1944, only 20 Tallboy equipped Lancasters could be mustered. A mere six would carry the JW mine. Given the difference in weight, those Lancasters carrying the Tallboys were to return to their bug infested paddle steamer accommodation in Yagodnik after the attack. Meanwhile, the boys with the mines, if they still had a thousand gallons of fuel left, would head directly back to the UK. When they reached the fjord, B-Force, which included the mine carrying lanks, had three aiming points. They would drop the mines to the north and south of Tirpitz in the hope that the 48 mines deployed would make contact with the ship's hull. If they did, it was hoped that the relatively small charge would be enough to break the relatively thin armour covering it. My sources put it down to somewhere between two thirds of an inch thick to two sheets of one inch thick armour. The plan didn't please everyone. And when 617 and 9 Squadron reached the target and found it engulfed in a protective smokescreen, the men became even more displeased. For several of the six crews armed with the JW mine, they seriously questioned the logic behind carrying them in the first place. Squadron leader Tony Iverson explained the general opinion of the mines when he said, we were not carrying the 12,000 pound tall boy bombs, but what were known as Johnny Walkers, which were funny wartime bombs that were supposed to fall into the fjord 
reach the bottom and jump about in the hope that in one of their jumps they would strike the underside of the tirpitz. We carried 12 JWs, each of a thousand pounds, while others carried tall boys. I cannot think of anything more stupid than the JWs that we carried that day. There was no point in taking them back. I said to Frank, if you can work out when we should bomb, let them go. We bombed on dead reckoning. One or two crews brought tall boys back to Russia. They were very expensive bombs. Interestingly, in his 1998 interview conducted by the Imperial War Museum, Iverson's only comment about the JW mine was, we were carrying a 5,000 pound bomb, when asked about his armament. It seems to have made that much of an impression on him. Mick Maguire seemed to agree with Iverson and added, if by some remote chance one of them had hit their turbots, the armour plating would have shrugged it off. It had a very small charge. I thought they were a bloody waste of time, and it would have been far better to have all the lanks carrying tall boys. What's more, from the sounds of it, the experimental mines were a pretty precarious cargo in themselves. The very fact that each JW mine contained hydrogen inside made them a concern for the crews. The men were told to avoid unnecessary jolts, and to jettison the mines if attacked by enemy aircraft or anti-aircraft fire. Seeing that so many Lancasters from 617 and 9 Squadron ended up making very rough landings in Russia, they were lucky that none were lost through an exploding mine. Interestingly, one Lank made such a hard landing that its tall boy became detached and shot out in front of it across the ground. But again, that's a story for a different video. Another important factor, especially given the difficulties in identifying turpits through the smokescreen, was that at all costs, the mine could not be flown back to Russia or the UK. It was literally a ticking time bomb that would self-destruct after about 15 hours after having been activated. It wasn't worth the risk. So like Iverson, most were simply thrown overboard whether the Lancasters were over land or sea. Although the attack on the 15th of September didn't result in a total destruction of the Tirpitz, at least one tall boy did get a near miss. This led to the great battleship being transferred to another berth at Tromso. The Germans had just put the key asset in the North Sea within range of the Lancaster, just. But the JW mine, according to Iverson, would not be used in the later attacks flown from Britain. He said F Fox was now equipped with a tall boy. We had, thankfully, given up on all those experiments with jumping Johnny Walker mines. So according to the information I could find, the JW mine was never used again operationally, which I think is a great shame. For its pure ingenuity, I feel that it should have been developed further. Perhaps if a bigger charge was fitted, and it could have been adapted to be used in shallow water, it might have obliterated Axis navies. Then again, by 1944, did it really have many viable targets left to anchor? Only one JW mine is known to survive, and it was found, perhaps ironically, strolling around the hills at Carfield. Well, not literally. It can now be found in a Norwegian museum. It's the last example of one of the most genius bombs to come out of World War II, at least in my opinion. So, was it the fault of the design, or its use that ultimately led to its failure? Well, I think it's a bit of both. Tell me what you think in the comments, and if you made it this far, please like the video to help it spread to others. And hey, if you like the videos that I make, consider supporting me as a patron or through other ways on my support page. For extra credit, why not watch the next video on screen right now? It's a good one.